Hello, everyone. Welcome to the weekly Knowledge Bolide Hangout, sponsored by Topher Spin Meteorites. I uh, got a really cool hangout today. Not a whole lot of show and tell on my part. Um, some really cool updates um, and also a new segment to the show. So let me go ahead and throw it over to Ron Metchus for the first, oh. uh, if he's not ready just yet. Um, um, oh, he is? Good. We're going to throw it over to Ron for the first show and tell item. And then I'm going to uh, probably put on the PowerPoint and run through the agenda real quick. But I want to get right into the show and tell with Ron and then James Shelton with his brand new camera. So okay. there we go. All right, so what I have this week, I just got a new, and I put a video on this with my granddaughter, is a, an unclassified, it's either in Moroccan or Niger iron. Um, a little controversy about this one and all the paperwork I got. Uh, I have a little video that I took outside I'm going to show. I'm going to share my screen here. Uh, let me change over real quick. And to that share. video was very, uh, very enjoyable, by the way. I oh, had. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't she a doll? Emily's, Emily's crazy. <laughs> okay, can you see that? Oh, oh yes. Oh, yeah. Okay, so I'm just going to read it. Just a little 45 second video. Um, mm -hmm. I've turned the audio off. I don't know if it works, but I'll just. Go ahead and just talk over it. So this is a 231 gram piece I got from Steve Arnold. Not the meteorite man, Steve Arnold, but the other Steve Arnold. Um, uh, there's a little bit of lipping right there, as you can see, around the rock. Um, if you're, and there's a little bit more on top as well. Um, now this is either a Niger unclassified iron or a Moroccan classified iron, depending on who I believe. <laughs> And uh, I took these pictures outside because I think it shows up a little bit better. It, it is one of my smaller irons, and so it's pretty nice. I took a chance on it. Mm. Um, I didn't see all that lifting when I bought it, you know, the photos that they showed, but uh, it was kind of a nice surprise when I got it. All right, that's, that's that. Um, so, anyway, so that's, uh, so I put out a video on this with my six-year-old granddaughter, Emily. You can find it on either uh, YouTube or uh, Facebook, just Google my name. Um, and she, she is so funny. <laughs> I just, I was laughing all the way through this thing. Uh, <laughs> it just, she's a bit of a character. Anyway, and, so that, that's and, all I got. Yeah, Ron, and parts of that iron, it looks like, and, and other parts it doesn't, but it looks like the collision of two pieces of metal together. That's, that's what I was thinking. I, it almost looks like, crack of some sort. Now, I was going to I was going to ask for suggestions. I, I would like to get this cut in half. Can you, know, can you run the possible. video back? Run the video one more time while we're discussing this. Because okay, let me run. I'll rerun it then. Let me, yeah, uh, at certain angles, it looks like there's two sheets of metal coming together and, yeah. and forming. Like here, you can start seeing it in that big top divot. There you see it around the edge. Yeah, let me pause it right here. Yeah. Um, Right, in here. can you see my mouse pointer moving? Yeah. Okay, yeah, right along in here. Uh -huh. And then uh, as you go around, you can see more right oh, here. Yeah. It does look like two rocks together. Yeah. Uh, but when we look at the other side, it looks like one rock. Yeah, everything right there, you, see, you don't see any kind of a, well, maybe. Yeah, right there. Mm. Yeah. So I'm not quite sure what this is. It's like, it's mm. not classified. I bought it on uh, just kind of, a, I took a chance on it. Uh, it looked kind of neat. But I want to get it cut in half, and that would tell me if there's like a, a, a joint of some sort, or I don't know if it's a coarse, medium, fine, off the heat, whatever it is. Um, so I'd, I was, I'd like to ask if you have any suggestions who I can send this to, can cut it in half and polish both sides. Oh, I, I know, um, well, <laughs> I know for beyond a shadow of a doubt that Craig right now is doing some amazing cutting work. Um, Craig Lyman, okay. uh, he was just posting uh, videos today on Facebook of the work he's doing on a huge Imolac stone, and it's it's just beautiful. So okay. that would be that would be a slam dunk for him. Um, I know that uh, Stephen Amara, hey buddy <laughs> from Space Matter, joining us today. Um, 
I know that he does some cutting, but it's mainly chondrites. I don't know if he's gotten into the uh, the irons yet. Yeah, I want somebody that's, that specializes in irons. It's, yeah, you know, yeah. I, so. I would definitely send it to uh, to Craig. Okay, he can would, you send his contact information? Yeah, yeah. I'll I'll, I'll definitely reach out. Or okay, send, me, great. send me an IM, and, and I'll send you because he's great. In fact, I have this entire box. Oh my god. It's got to be at least seven, <laughs> seven oh kilos worth wow. of stuff that's got that's going to go to him, and he's going to resurface and, and re etch and stabilize and and some of it's really nice. Like here's a piece of vermilion. This is like a very rare pelicite. Oh. So I want to get that re etched. But yeah, Craig, Craig's the man, cutting and and okay. etching. And now his son is helping him too. So Minnesota, video. Yeah. yeah, Minnesota meteorites. Okay. Um, Mr. James Shelton, are you ready? Yes, I am. Nice. I, uh, I just pulled out some samples because I got a new camera and I wanted to see how well it was going to show up here. This is uh, Independence, Missouri. It fell in uh, 1917, about two or three miles from where, where I live here. Wow. And this set on a, this single, it was a single uh, individual and it sat on a kitchen shelf for like 60 years before uh, the descendants allowed it to be cut. Wow. Uh, this is- Wait, don't go, off probably... don't, don't go off of that one so quick. Okay. <laughs> wow. A, a single stone. Now, do, do you know if it was a witnessed fall or if it was just one- Yeah, it fell? was. It fell a few feet from a, a guy uh, in a plowed field. Oh my gosh. Yeah. What a what a story! A single stone witnessed fall two miles from your house, and it sat on a sh on a kitchen in, in a kitchen for sixty years. Yeah. Oh, wow. Uh, that that's a, his a historic piece. Okay, uh, this is uh, Odessa, and uh, I got this from Tom Rodman, who was the director of the museum there in Odessa. If you ever go, the gift shop has really got some bargains. This is uh, 134 grams. And I think I paid about 50 cents a gram for it. Oh, no. Just an iron. Wait. Wait. <laughs> and how long have you had that one? Uh, I'd have to look it up. It's probably about 10 years. Okay. Wow. Tom Rodman was probably passed on by now. He was on the original dig. He was, he was an old guy when I met him. But he was one of the original drillers when they were trying to find out what was at the bottom of the crater. Wow. Cool. That's a nice shape. And then I, I, I uh, laid out a piece of Cape York to see if we could see the, uh, yeah. the Thompson lines. Not the Vindman but the Thompson lines in it. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I don't want to put you on the spot, but you pointed out that they're not, it's not a Vindman and it's Newman lines. Can you explain? No. Can you explain? No, a not bit? Newman Thompson. Uh, there was, sorry, there was a, Thompson line. There was an Englishman that uh, came up with uh, Vidman Staten pattern before Vidman Staten, but yeah. his his work was lost in a book and it was mm -hmm. found recently. So I, I don't call him uh, Vidman Staten. I call him Thompson lines because he was first. <laughs> same thing. <Okay>. Same thing. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I'm glad I asked. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> And then this is another Missouri meteorite. This is Palisite. Oh, it's Conception the, Junction or uh, Conception Junction. You got it. Yeah. Wow! Yeah. Wow! Nice. That now I want to try one more thing with the camera before uh, we go away here. Now, Conception Junction is a. Oh, you're standing on your head. There you are. <laughs> okay, zoom out here. Uh, Well, I'm not unzooming. I'm happy with the camera. If, uh, if anybody's interested, it's uh, on uh, Amazon, and that's what it is, an IPVO VZR, and it's on a gantry arm that hangs out on, from a base. Hmm. Well, it's actually, it actually worked really well, because like the focal point was set, and then when you zoomed in, it worked really well. Yeah, yeah it's <laughs> autofocus. You can turn that off and lock it if you want. Well, awesome. Thank you very much for sharing those pieces with us. That's
That's really awesome. I, I love uh, people who collect from their home state um, and, you know, would love to get all the ones, but unfortunately Arizona is one of those weird states that has like 300 meteorites and, <laughs> and 200 of them are under a hundred grams. And, you know, most of those are under 10 grams. Like who, who classifies a five gram meteorite, you know? Uh, let me hit pause one second and I'm going to put up the, uh, the presentation real quick. All right. So this is the rough agenda for today. We have a, a check-in with uh, Marco Geiser in Germany. And then uh, I'm very, very happy to announce a new segment on the show that we're going to have from time to time. Uh, we're extremely fortunate to have Daniel Shake, uh, one of our uh, one of our friends, actually a, a meteorite classifier. So uh, on his segment uh, entitled From the Lab, he's actually going to take us through the classification process of meteorites and talk to us about the science uh, from a laboratory and scientific viewpoint, geochemistry, what he sees and, and help us understand the process a little bit more. So I'm super pumped about that. Again, I did the same thing I did with uh, Marco's video. I clicked through, got some screen grabs. I didn't watch it. So I'm really pumped to watch with you guys for the first time. Um, huge part of the show today is going to be an um, update on Winchcomb. Uh, some amazing, cool, cool stuff. And then Ingenuity's uh, third flight. Uh, show and tell as we've already had and some more, as well as some fake palisites uh, that are hitting the market. Um, and I actually have them, so I'm going to show them to you. Yeah, so um, Marco Geiser checking in from Germany uh, with a beautiful NWA, I believe. And I'm super proud of myself. If you look at the screen grab of him, I caught a bee flying by. <laughs> uh, it took me an extra like six minutes to get that exact screen grab. So enjoy it, folks, because that bee flew right by. <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy Marco. Uh, that's cool. Hello everyone, I hope you're all doing good and you have a great hangout. Yeah, as you can see, we have a... Sorry. Very sunny day and um, I want to show you a nice um, sculptured Conrad today. So have fun and let's have a look on the piece. Okay guys, that's the piece that I want to show today. It's a 3.3 kilogram, not oriented, <laughs> but very nice sculpture oh, of ordinary chondrite. As you can see, there are many, many rack maglips on that piece. And yeah, for me, such pieces are cosmic art. Yes. Look at that. Beautiful. Beautiful. <laughs> Three point three kilograms of real space art. Mm. Yeah, how do you display it though? That's the only problem. It's beautiful from all sides. <laughs> Rotating really stand. Great lighting. Yeah, guys, I hope you also like that piece. And um, of course, I wish you a great hangout. Have fun and see you next week. Bye bye, guys. <laughs> you guys see the bee at the last second? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, you got you got to love Marco, but this time it wasn't and an orient. See you next week. Bye bye, guys. Today, today it wasn't. I an wish you a great hangout. Get photo bomb. And <laughs> see you next week. Bye bye, guys. Marco, we love you, buddy. Thank, thanks for submitting your videos. We love it every single week. Um, I am now super super happy to present the first installment of From the Lab. So this is episode one. And um, let me see here. I thought, I had, yeah, we do have Daniel in here. Um, he's going to be uh, available for questions afterwards. So let's go ahead and watch episode one 
and he's featuring a meteorite from a friend of ours. Welcome to From the Lab episode one for the Topher Spin Weekly Meteorite Group Hangout. I'm Daniel Sheik, and today I'll be covering one of the very interesting classifications that I'm currently working on and plan to submit to the Meteoritical Bulletin. So this sample is uh, actually a very interesting sample. It was sent to me by geologist Juan A. Poblador. Uh, and when he sent it to me, he actually wasn't sure what it was. He thought it could be a potential meteor wrong, or if it was something perhaps in LL or L6, as for what he told me. Uh, a couple of things that I noted when I obtained the sample from him was I noticed that there was some minor fusion crust present on some of the pieces, but not all of them. So it appears a lot of it was weathered away. I did notice, of course, that the interior was weathered. You have these uh, zones right here that clearly have been weathered, but some of the areas are relatively fresh on the inside. You can also notice the presence of vesicles throughout the samples. Some of them are small. You have these holes right here. A few of them are larger. And you also notice these melt pockets right here, or melt areas, whatever you want to call them. And you can see it's quite variable depending on what piece you're looking at. Some of them contain a greater volumetric percent, and some of them, like this one, you can't even see them. So that was something also to find interesting about the sample. The next thing, of course, to do is to look at it under this section. So I did petrography work. And so this is in plain polarized light. This is in cross polarized light. And the first thing I noticed was an echogranular texture. What that means is that the relative grain size between all the major grains is, for the most part, similar. In this case, uh, most of these grains were actually made up of recrystallized enstatite. So you can see the low, the low interference colors, the low birefringence. Uh, try to ignore these small marks here. That's just remnants of the carbon coating process. But basically, uh, most of this, about 94 volume percent of this sample is uh, recrystallized enstatite with an average grain size of about 75 plus or minus 10 microns. It could be a little larger, but that's generally what I found from measuring some of them. And there are accessory phases that are also found here. It might be tough to see them, but there's albitic plagioclase, which means it's relatively sodium rich. You have a couple of different sulfides in here. So you have old hemite, which is calcium sulfide. You have dubrilite, you have troilite, and then of course you have uh, what appeared to be a glassy phase that was uh, silica rich, or I guess quartz normative, if you want to call it that way. And then lastly, I had very tiny grains of metal, mostly chemocyte, scattered throughout the sample. It really depended on what fragments you hit. So going back here, some of these I saw metal, some of these I didn't. So I didn't hit too many grains, but there were some metal grains there. So in terms of geochemistry, by hitting this enstatite, it's basically pure <coughs> enzyme. That means is that it's extremely magnesium rich and for the most part, uh, this is just, for the most part, I guess you'd say near end member or almost pure enstatite composition. The plagioclase, as I said, was albitic, meaning that it was mostly sodium rich, so not much calcium in it. And there is some amount of potassium in there, a small amount. And I actually managed to get some of the silicon from the canocyte or the metal, and there's about one to two, about 1.5 weight percent of silicon in there. So what does this all mean? What, what is this, what, why am I doing all this? Well, from what I noted, this looked to be either a melted enstatite chondrite, recrystallized, or an aubrite, both of which contain, are pretty much made up primarily of pure enstatite plus some other phases. So that was sort of where I'm getting at by finding the enstatite. Now the question is, which of the two is it? And if it is an enstatite chondrite, what type? Because we have EH chondrites and we have EL chondrites. So primarily looking at this, uh, this seems to be what I believe to be an enstatite melt rock, in specifics, an EL melt rock. So EL due to the fact that uh, there's enstatite in the sample, uh, there's chemocyte with low amounts of silica, or silicon, sorry, and then there's also, in terms of what sulfides are present, Daubery lights and uh, old hemite, petroleite, especially the fact that the dobrylite contains some mag manganese in there, seems to favor more of an EL over an EH. 
And lastly, I said this was a melt rock because of the fact that the instantite is primarily recrystallized. It's not as large as you would see in aubrites, you know, about 75 to maybe 90 microns. It's not, you know, 400, 500 microns you normally see in aubrites. Uh, there's also vesicles scattered throughout the sample. And of course you have melt pockets of, you know, varying abundances in different samples. That tells you this sample was incompletely melted. And if you'd like to learn more on EL melt rocks, there's a very, very cool research article by Dr. Alan Rubin back in 2016. It's called Impact Melting of the Largest Known Instantite Meteorite, Alhagonia 001, a fossil EL chondrite. Uh, I have actually taken a look at Alhagonia 001. There's a lot of pairings to this EL melt rock. And a question you might have is, well, is this rock potentially paired to it? And it does have a lot of similarities to it. The only difference I noticed primarily was the grain size, that it was a little smaller. And I did manage to see some of this fusion crust here. So it looks to be a little more fresh than some of the other pieces of Ahogonia 001 in those pairings I've seen. So I can't definitively say if this is paired with it or not, but it does have similarities. But then again, they're both EO melt rocks. So if you would like your sample to be shown next, uh, please send me samples to classify. I am working for the next uh, three months or so doing full-time classifications uh, for funding uh, since I'm attending, going to be attending Portland State University for my PhD in the fall. So uh, any samples that you'd like to get classified, please send those to me. I'll be happy to take care of any lab work. And if I find an interesting sample, I might show it on one of the next coming uh, Topher Spin Meteor Group weeks. So thanks for having me. And here's my email in case you'd like to contact me or through Facebook. Thank you. That is awesome. I love it. Cool. Absolutely. Um, like it's ridiculously hard to get the the ear uh, or the attention of any <clears throat> any uh, laboratory or scientist um, who's willing to to look at uh, or, you know, make available to submit samples to. So that's quite a, uh, quite a generous uh, opportunity for everyone for real meteorites only. Okay. This is not a, is it a meteorite thing? <laughs> no garden rocks. Yeah. Uh, I have a, I have a quick question. Uh, the, we're not seeing this screen share anymore, are we? No. Okay, awesome. Uh, Daniel, I have, a, I have a question. When I first saw um, the, the meteorite that you were talking about just now, um, yeah, the, the two things that stood out to me were uh, how much it looked like, Al, how, Al, I mispronounced it, so I'll try to say it the right way, Alhogonia 001. Um, like you said, it looks a lot fresher because there's fusion crust, and some of the like, most prized Alhogonias are, have like a blue center. Um, do, can can you explain that to us a little bit? Like, were they originally all grayish blue in the center, and through their terrestrial aging, lost that color and gone uh, weathering tan? Uh, that's a good question, Tilfer. Uh, I've looked a little bit into Algonia and seen some of the effects on some of the samples. Uh, to my experience, from what I know, uh, the fresh color is that grayish interior, that's normally the fresh uh, instatite color. Uh, once, of course, it's been sitting out in the desert for, you know, however long it's been, it's been uh, contaminated via alteration effects via either water or, you know, wind processes. And so you get that tannish discoloration. There has been some, you know, some work done that there might have been some uh, in situ alteration on the parent body, but I haven't read further into it, I mostly just, uh, you know, just looked at some of the contamination effects on earth, but that would be my first uh, guess as to why you see a lot of discoloring in some samples, whereas some other ones you see more fresh surfaces. Mm -hmm. And thank you. Um, can you also explain uh, as simply as possible so I can understand uh, what an enstatite is? So enstatite itself is a it's a magnesium rich pyroxene. So in terms of composition, the composition of this pyroxene is Mg2Si2O6, uh, stoichiometric. And so what, what I was doing when I was showing the geochemistry and the composition, I was showing what's called a pyroxene quadrilateral. So this is looking at all the normal pyroxenes that you find uh, in nature in both terrestrial 
terrestrial samples and in meteorites, and you plot them according to how much calcium, iron, and magnesium they contain. This is just representative. It, it's kind of a visual way to see it. And so you kind of saw that the, the red dot was basically on one side of the quadrilateral. And that's because of the composition of this sample was almost pure end member entite. There's basically, uh, you know, no uh, divalent iron in the silicates and there's ex very little calcium. So it's basically gonna stick on that side of the magnesium rich side. That's why I call it enstatite. If it had some iron in it, I would just call it uh, a low calcium pyroxene, but because it's so magnesium rich, mm. you can just call it enstatite. Okay, awesome. Yeah, glad you explained that. Um, <laughs> Can I ask a question, Toko? Yeah, go for it. Uh, uh, I was just wondering, in that chemical makeup of that uh, meteorite slice, what is the most detrimental to preserving that meteorite? Is it uh, just general weathering, or is it water, or is a combination of all those things, water, wind, sun, and such? Because is, is, it, is it correct to say that any meteorite that lands on Earth is automatically contaminated. So whether we choose to clean them up using water or whatever, and possibly removing some of the crystals that may be on the surface of the meteorite, I would figure those would have already been gone if it's been lying in the desert for a while. <coughs> I'm not quite sure of what I'm trying to get at, but uh, <laughs> it was kind of long in the tooth. But uh, I noticed in Antarctica, they go to great lengths to wear gloves and use tongs and plastic bags to try to preserve the purity of a particular meteorite. Whereas when you're out in the desert with a metal detector, I don't see anybody picking it up with gloves. I see him just picking it up, putting it on a scale and weighing it. Well, I'll, I'll interject. I, I don't mean to answer for Daniel, but I'll interject and try my best at that. Um, in Antarctica, it's a totally different experience. It's 100% scientists. Every mm -hmm. single sample is collected for scientific purposes. Right. And the entire environment is clean. It is a clean environment. So it doesn't matter if it's been in Antarctica for six months or for six years or for 6,000 years. It's still mm -hmm. relatively untouched, unchanged versus we're going to get into the uh, fall in the UK, the Winchcombe fall, and we're going to mm -hmm. see the exact opposite is true in that case. Does that mm -hmm. hopefully explain a little bit? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, any other, I have, I have another question for Daniel, if no one else does, I don't want to monopolize the time. I kind of have a question too. Go for it. <laughs> uh, so I heard that there is a direct correlation between um, thermal metamorphism and weathering, that they can almost um, appear to be similar, or, or the effects are somewhat similar. And to me... It's almost counterintuitive, but not. Can you explain that? Is that, is that, am I mixing something up here? That's a good question. Uh, so, th so thermal metamorphism, it's, it's what's called a secondary effect, meaning that it takes place on whatever parent body asteroid the sample comes from. Weathering is what's called a tertiary effect, which means once it lands in earth, that's when the tertiary effects take place. The relationship you're probably thinking of is probably due to the fact of what thermal metamorphism actually does to some chondrites. So normally when that happens, you tend to get, uh, you know, recrystallization, you tend to get larger grain sizes of both silicates, metal and sulfides. And so when you increase the surface area of these samples, when they're exposed, you know, once, once you therm thermally metamorphose something, you get larger metal grains, larger sulfides, it lands on earth, there's much more essentially there's much more room for weathering to take place. And so you have larger surface area of grains. Sometimes when you have metamorphism and you get subsequent impacting on the surface, you can get uh, annealing of samples, which means you get metamorphism driven by shock impact on the asteroid by impactors. So you form these cracks. And then when they land on earth, you have these weathering veins that can 
use these cracks to bring in uh, weathering products and, you know, alter metal and sulfides. So I haven't uh, read a specific paper that's shown a direct correlation, but I can imagine that you can have uh, weathering, you know, taking effect just because when you thermally metamorphose a sample and you expose it on earth, there's much more metal and sulfides to, to do the damage per se. Awesome. Thank you for the explanation. I appreciate it. Yeah, I totally look forward to having Daniel with us uh, from time to time as his time permits, because we're going to keep him busy with qualified quality samples uh, for him to classify for us. And um, I just, my, my, po my, my leaving comment for, for Daniel, uh, I'll let anyone else talk after that, but you may have mentioned on Facebook, hey, if you if you you know thinking about doing the next one uh, on Eritrea 004, I'm just giving you my thumbs up on that, okay? <laughs> Coming from a guy who has it tattooed on his body, do it for me. <laughs> I would love that. <laughs> the same detailed process for Eritrea 004. That'd be so cool. It's such an interesting sample, uh, Eritrea, and there's there's still so much so much work I had planned to do with the sample, but you know, other other classifications, of course, are the priority. But I definitely want to want to discuss Eritrea. I think there's a lot to look at when you look at both the high metal and low metal lithologies. You know, there's some there's some people who claim that you know just winonites can have varying amounts of metal, but you can actually see within some pieces of them differing lithologies, which is more to the story than there is. So I think it's interesting yeah. to talk about. Yeah. Um, I'm glad you think so because that that we that would be a good that would be a good one to to do a little chat on or anything else you have on in front of you your microscope. So uh, we definitely appreciate your involvement, Daniel. Thank you so much. Sure, no problem. Thanks for having me, Topher. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thanks so much. Thank thanks, you, Daniel. Thanks. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Daniel. Um, I am going to. Stop this for a second. All right, so now we're checking it. I was super, super proud of this interview I was able to do. I don't know if you guys have seen it yet or not. Yes, I have. Yeah, what an amazing family. I mean, th this family, the, the Wilcock family, actually had the, the Winchcombe meteorite impact in their driveway. And they are the most humble, down to earth, <laughs> greatest people. I had conversation with them and email exchange. They're just phenomenal people. And um, yeah, you got to watch the video, watch the interview. You'll be laughing with us. Um, they donated everything to science. They, they know the value of it, but they donated 100% of it to science. So just a, a really, really cool story. And one of those that we need right about now. But I wanted to give a, an update on what's going on in Winchcombe because my buddy, our buddy, uh, Juan Avidas from Jurassic Dreams has been there for the last six or seven days. And <laughs> there he is with the impact driveway. <laughs> yep. While he's there hunting, he's representing the, uh, the Meteorite Mansion folks. So appreciate that. Cool. Um, the yeah, family, so I'm, like kind of I'm sorry, kind of surprised there wasn't any video of uh, diamond saws and uh, cutting out a piece of pavement there. I, <laughs> I, I or think, videos of somebody licking the driveway. I know. <laughs> the same thing. It's it's just a little too far for me, or else I, you would see my video uh, in a private group only. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the family was was so nice. They actually um, wrote uh, wrote little notes to us, and then is giving me a sample of their front lawn soil. And they thought it was a crazy loon for asking for it. <laughs> but, uh, I'm so happy for Juan. After six yeah. days of hunting, he finally oh, nice. found a piece. That's cool. Yeah, that's awesome. And it's yeah. tiny. Yeah, but it's it's absolutely uh, irrefutably correct. Yep. Yeah. You can see the the contraction cracks. Mm -hmm. It's 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 amazing. And I think he's the one who's now I I've been trying to pay attention and trying to stay in the know of what's going on with the Winchcombe recovery. 
And my buddy Juan has been there on site for the last week. But I've learned a lot in the last uh, six hours of what's going on with the Winchcombe recovery. One of the key figures is Chris Casey. Uh, this man has made it his full-time job to hunt Winchcombe. Um, in one video, he's mentioning that he's been hunting for 17 days. Um, I'm like, they were out there two days after the fall. He's been camping and he's had success. Public ground, just taking a walk in the park, 22nd of March, 2021. I have just stumbled upon my second Winchcombe meteorite find. Beautiful scene. Oh. Looks like about uh, 12 grams, a bit more. Just gonna pick her up now from the in situ. It's one half of it. Oh, there's a crumb there. I'm gonna have to carefully, I might have to put the phone down for this one. Yeah, that's, that's half of it there. And the other half is here. Ooh! Man, that's a, that is oh, such a nice rock. one. <laughs> oh yeah. Uh, yeah. That's beautiful. Incredible. Second winch kind of meteorite find. Let's put her back with a... There it is. So we'll get that out of the grass in a second. So a lot of crumbs there. I'm gonna have to pick that with, put that straight into a plastic bag. 17 days of hunting, didn't find anything, constant gridding. Um, and here we go, second find. Excellent. Happy days. Happy days indeed. Congrats, Chris. Congrats. That's wonderful. Super, super happy for you. Um, and like I said, he's had success. That's not the only one. This is him uh, with Luther Jackson. Which guy meet you right? Number three. Just going to get her out here. Wow. Fraction. Yeah. Oh, okay. fragile. In. Oh, that looks nice. There's, yeah, with the little biddies. There's a lot of crumbs. I don't know if this is one. No, uh, the holder for the back. Yeah, there's a little. No, it's another pit. It's another pit. It's like I'm living it. Yeah. <laughs> so, look how deep that grass is. Yeah, and can you imagine that poor thing getting hit with a lawnmower? Oh, my God. <laughs> oh no. No way. It'd be Don't like say that. Black <laughs> It'd be a look at the smile on Chris's face. Yeah. That's that's a man who's been scouring for 17 days and hit pay dirt. Space yeah. dirt. Those are gorgeous. Mm -hmm. I love that he has two pieces of that puzzle one as well. Congratulations. Yeah. Um, really, congratulations so much for for that. Um, it's it's quite remarkable and from what I understand but can't I don't have all the details and I can't share them if I had them there's uh, a very um, arduous recovery um, process being carried out um, it's being gridded it's being hundreds of man hours are being spent and um, they're recovering uh, material um, the largest that I know of <clears throat> that was found used to be like a 62 gram one, I believe, from the driveway. Now um, it's one in the field. One of the grid walkers found was 150 grams. Oh, Ooh, nice. Nice. Ooh. Very nice. So, yeah. So that's, um, 
I'm just, I'm super proud of, of the work that's being done over there. And I have nothing to do with it, but I'm just super proud to be involved in it, to be able to be a conduit to bring it to you guys. Um, the Winchcombe uh, driveway with the Wilcock family uh, interview was a, was a, a highlight, of, <clears throat> a highlight of my meteorite career so far. You know, how often do you get to talk to someone who's had that rare an, of an event? And then uh, Luther Jackson has been a meteorite collector for for a long time, longer than I've been cool. And uh, he found his first meteorite. He's from the UK, and he found it in the UK, and it's a carbonaceous. So he like checked all his boxes off. All. So congrats to both Luther and Chris, and I really uh, appreciate you allowing me to share this with the group today because I had to ask permission, and they were all about it. They wanted us in, in America to know that it's not big news. That they're keeping it, they're British, they're keeping it low key. It's being recovered. Don't worry about it. It's how the Brits do it. <laughs> um, they don't want uh, everyone and their brother storming this small little village and making a, a mockery of, of, of what we're doing. So it's being done properly. A lot of the material is going to the Natural History Museum. And uh, yeah, so I'm super proud of my friends uh, for, for getting involved, feet on the ground and, and Chris, 17 or 20 days out there camping, man. <laughs> Way to go, bud. That's what I wanted to ask you, Topher. Uh, what a fall has been reported. You know, they're trying to obviously keep this one low key. Uh, is it insane to have the town increase 10, 10 times the normal population? When that when that's announced, that's why they're trying to keep it low key. No, I just think it has a lot to do with with, with uh, Pat. I, I I want you to chime in on this, but I think two things are mainly are coming into play. Um, the 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 mentality of the people. We have the, mm -hmm. the culture of the people. They're they're British. They're very reserved. They're very private. They're very quiet. They don't like a whole lot of fuss. And um, secondly, there is a pandemic going on. They don't want everyone and their brother storming their town from God knows where. So I think those are the two main reasons. Pat, you might have a third. Yeah, I've, I've, uh, I have I've was involved in, in the Novato fall. Uh, never did find a piece of it. Walked right past one. But um, the, the, the main concern, so it, it's not like the population of the town is going to multiply by 10. There's, for Novato, being right in close to the Bay Area, uh, very easy to get to, uh, a lot of public land. Um, you know, there were maybe 12 or 14 of us that were hunting. Uh, but I, the, the, the big concern is about people's private property rights uh, in some of the other falls, especially in the Southwest, uh, people have been, uh, one that happened on the Indian Reservation, the Navajo Reservation. Um, People were trespassing, um, not obtaining permission, uh, and it only takes a little bit of that to piss everybody off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I know for a fact that um, Juan was going to all the farmers and getting permission uh, to, to to go on their land. Um, and he's a very, you know, he's a very engaging person. So I'm sure everyone that he met was was pretty open to it. Um, I have heard, though, that the locals really don't have a big interest in it. Um, the, the town locals, they're not the ones out there hunting it. You know, so um, it's not like, I mean, they, they are participating in the hunt, but it's not like there's meteorite fever running through the town and everyone is, is walking grids. Um, uh, I, I think it would be a little bit different here. Um, yeah, yes. now the, the ones that happen in Northwest Africa, uh, there, well, like when um, Tarda fell, there were hundreds of people on their hands and knees <clears throat> coming through the dirt and sand to find the tiniest little bits. Um, and un unfortunately, you know, in the U.S., we've, we've had the blessing and the curse of having the meteorite men on TV and of course, the Hollywood people really wanted it to be all about how much is it worth, how much is this meteorite worth, how many dollars a gram, all that kind of stuff. And so you get the, yeah. the get rich quick uh, 
part of the population. But as long as you just have the meteorite collector and science part of the population, uh, and, and people are uniformly respectful of private property rights, uh, then it can be managed. I, that was the that was the third key that I was forgetting was the property rights because um, yeah it's it's their, their culture to be reserved quiet we have a an old quaint town don't mess it up um, there's a pandemic going on and get off my lawn <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> does anyone have anything they'd like to show off for us today I've got a little show and tell nice let me. Uh... Switch over to the other camera. So here's a uh, here's a little demonstration of my. I've, I've got the uh, the camera pointing straight down at the at the desktop. So here's a demonstration of of the difference that the ref reflected cross polarized light makes. So right right now, the polarizer in the optical path and the polarizer in front of the LEDs are are in parallel. And if I rotate 90 degrees, no, it doesn't yeah, that's quite dramatic, isn't it? Yeah, yep. it is quite dramatic now. Unfortunately, it's not focusing very well for me, but, uh, but you can see all of the detail that pops. And uh, one of the good things about being disorganized is you get <laughs> to cover all sorts of stuff when you clean up. So I little cleanup in the uh, in the uh, lab here today and uh, found this uh, it's, it's actually three pieces See, you can't see anything like that there's with uh, with the polarizers parallel mm -hmm. and there's with the polarizers at 90 degrees uh, it's yeah, such a difference yeah wow. it, it's literally like x-ray glasses Yep. Oh my God, that's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. This one's in line for the saw. You just found that laying around? Um, it was in, it was in a bag. <laughs> <laughs> well, there, there was some. Pat, the, can you put that one back on the top? There was like something that really caught my eye on the top. Yeah, there was a three D one in there. A really round one. Yeah, right towards the top. It's like this little. Um, square, keep up, keep up a little more. Right, yeah, right, right there. Yeah, it's oh. like, like what the heck's going on in there? That's actually a dark inclusion, and um, and it's it's interesting too. It has a couple of little tiny hair uh, hairline fractures in it. Um, this this uh, stone shows a few of those. There's another one. Um, I don't know if it'll focus there, right here. Yeah, you can see it. Another yeah. dark inclusion there. So it's not unusual, uh, and this this one is uh, LL for magnetic attraction. It'll, it'll in some locations it'll pick up the magnet, but you can shake it right off. Um, and uh, chondrules are fairly large, but not huge. And there is a little space between the chondrules, so this is either a, an LL three or an LL four, likely. And uh, there's actually one more wow. dark yeah. inclusion. Nice. Yeah, the, these these yeah. type of meteorites, it's not unusual to have carbonaceous chondrite uh, inclusions uh, in the uh, in the meteorite. So that one's that one's in line for the saw. That, that's beautiful. Man. Yeah, it's cool. And Thanks. then um, the other thing that I found when I was cleaning up was a bag of uh, Sakotalines that I bought in uh, in Denver in 2012. So this one is a is an oriented yeah. piece. And you can see it has a big bulbous nose and there's the uh, mm. there's the back side it has kind of a concave on the back side with a uh, with a rollover lip. Mm -hmm. And coming to a point, and there there are some flow lines. They're not showing very well. Yeah, you can see a little. Bit. Yeah, you can see them. Yeah. Yeah. And then, um, so you know the characteristics of orientation. So this is the the front side on this little oh, guy. Yeah. 
it yeah. had kind of a kind of a side where it's a bit lipped over there and you can see the flow lines around That's that nice. absolutely and you can see the rollover lip there <laughs> and then here's the back side wow yeah. cool. nice so this one has you know the the different stippled texture on the back side mm -hmm. it has some shallow regmaglyphs and has a very marked uh, rollover lip around the uh, around the perimeter. Wow! And that's beautiful. It has actually two complete rollover lips. Yes. Yeah. One on the side and one on the one on the back. Mm -hmm. And again, this one is similar sort of shaped, very jelly bean mm -hmm. shaped on the front side, and then yeah. there's the back side. Mm -hmm. And before everybody got excited about oriented meteorites, it was really easy to, uh, to pick through the boxes and the bags and so forth and find the oriented ones. And uh, they were the same price per gram as the, uh, as the not oriented ones, but mm. of course, not really like that anymore. Yeah, I know. Uh, so here's another tiny one that's a pretty classic oriented uh, mm. shape. And there's the backside. Wow. This this one was was very oriented in one direction, and so the uh, the overall shape and uh, the flow lines and the rollover lip are all, um, all top heavy almost. Yeah, very 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 well displayed. Yeah. But wow. all individuals. Sacodaline so has this interesting characteristic that sometimes the individuals will orient in multiple different directions. Oh, so nice. this one, I think for most of its flight, we're looking at the front side, but you can see that there is a very marked uh, rollover lip. Absolutely. That goes around the whole meteorite. Yeah. And yet on the back side, <laughs> We also see a rollover lip there. Wow. And That's so, cool. So this one is is a is a double oriented uh, sort of shape. That was super interesting. Wow. We'll call that one a clam. That is a keeper. <laughs> <laughs> a bivalve. Okay. So the, the other thing that I wanted to show um, is uh, I'm wearing my gut uranium shirt today. Um, you can actually legally own uranium in the United States. This is uh, depleted uranium. And it's, it's uh, in the bag under, uh, under a vacuum. Mm-hmm. And backfilled with a vacuum, then backfilled with a gas, and you can see, actually see the little bits of. Uh, th this is actually uranium metal, oh. and it is. Uh, yeah, I don't know if I can see the Geyer counter. Well, it's hard to see, but it's it's reading five microsieverts per hour. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then uh, this is uh, uranium dioxide. Yeah. A gram of it in the in the bottom of the test tube there. Yeah, you can actually you can see it. And uh, when they do um, uh, MOX or MOX uh, reactors, they use a combination of uranium uh, oxide and uh, plutonium oxides for the mixed oxide uh, fuels. And that's what I had. What are you planning on doing with that, may I ask? <laughs> <laughs> not, nothing evil, just, uh, just to have some in the collection. <laughs> okay, you're not meeting uh, Marty McFly down at the mall or anything? <laughs> nope, nope, no. Uh, <laughs> No Mr. Fusion uh, powered vehicles yet. Nice. Well, thanks for sharing, Awesome. Really, really awesome. I love when we can use technology to peel back the reflective layer uh, and, and actually peer inside. Um, that's and, it, and a great example today with the uh, reflective light looking right at us.
Um, hey, we got Mike Kelly with his hand up. What you got, buddy? Hey, how's it going? Uh, I saw Yang was on, so I wanted to start out with a uh, kind of a shout out piece to him. He made something available to me, which I was very happy for. Uh, and I know Stephen Amara was on here too. Stephen Amara posted a cool picture of a carbonaceous with a really interesting look to it. Uh, so I went ahead and, and picked up a piece. This is from Yang. So shout out to him uh, for a really interesting looking carbonaceous that's uh, under classification. And I don't know, CV3, CK, maybe something more interesting. So well, when that was it catches the reflection just right, it has a lot of texture in there. Yeah, it's it's yeah, got right a there. lot of a lot of conjurals going on and it's very interesting um, matrix look to it. Wow. So, very interested to see what it uh, turns out to be. I like taking uh, taking a gamble on things and uh, you know buying them before they're classified just to see what they become afterwards. On the, um, on the, the outside of that, the tan, what is that? Is that that's all. That's all. Uh, uh, caliche and uh, oh. and desert desert buildup. So okay, it's, it's got a lot of buildup on the outside, but the inside is very very um, to me unaltered looking. It looks very nice on the inside. Yeah, that uh, that was confusing to me. Wow, that's beautiful, man. Yeah, yeah. It's. Uh, it's I, I'm sure he was very glad when it uh, when it was cut open with the exterior looking like that to get the gem on the inside he got. So <laughs> nice. That's a great piece. Yeah. Um, and then of course. Uh, that made a lot of news on uh, on Facebook last week, so I had to pick up a piece of what should be becoming a, a group of uh, of CLs. Talk to us about that, because you're you're the guy who knows the most. Um. Well, I'm I'm still doing doing my homework on that. So I guess there's you know there was uh, finally uh, with this one there was five pieces in the uh, ungrouped carbonaceous. Um, meteorites uh, in the C, uh, C3 ungroups and the C4 ungroups uh, that I guess there is some uh, differentiation. I believe it's in the sulfides. I'd have to go check that out again. Um, that makes it so that these uh, ungroups are uh, their own parent body versus uh, like CMs or CKs. Hmm. Um, and what I found interesting was, uh, you know, they, they're, they're saying it's going to get named after uh, Lungana 001, which is a Australian meteorite from 1990, um, which surprisingly was not kind of the first of the grouping, if you look at it that way, but it doesn't make sense to name it after Coolidge, which I do believe is the oldest one of the five that was there, um, being that uh, you would have a carbonaceous, carbonaceous chondrite that would be a CC carbonaceous chondrite, so a CC, CC. <laughs> so I guess they opted to try to go with uh, Lungana, um, which obviously in, in the Met Bowl, you know, these are all still uh, listed as, as ungrouped. Um, but it's, uh, it's cool to have, uh, have two of them in there in the bag. And uh, the fun one with this is half of this guy is going to hit the, uh, the diamond wire tonight and uh, is heading Cavern's way. <laughs> I kind of expected that to happen. After. <laughs> That's yep. awesome. Well, our class. Thank you. Yep. I got I got two more cool kind of little ones. Um, this is uh, Parnelay. So uh, going after the uh, the subtypes, uh, I needed an LL three point six. And yeah. if you look at the LL three point six, is there's uh, there's twenty one of them out there, and I think nine of them are from Antarctica. Uh, oh, and of the rest of it, uh, the majority of them are very very small. This is kind of one of the only two non Antarctics that are over a kilogram. And this happens to be 77.6 kilograms TKW. Uh, and it's a piece from India, and it's old, 1857. So uh, rare, rare uh, petrology subtype, you know, from a spot you don't get too many uh, meteorites on the market from, you know, and, and old. So it's kind of got a little bit of everything going on for it. So wow. yeah, I figured. And, and uh, fantastic. In addition to that, Parnelly is used in a lot of papers as well. And mm -hmm. my understanding is the amount of it that's in private hands is pretty small. Yeah, so uh, I had to jump at a chance to uh, to close off the uh, the LL three point six. I figured that wouldn't potentially come up again in a long time, maybe. And this is a crazy one. And I know it's not very impressive on on video. Well, most of the micros aren't overly impressive on video. So, what's the rarest thing you all can think of that you could possibly get? Wow, hold on. 
Ah, God dang, dude. Black, Black Beauty or the, the 7034 and, and its uh, yeah. pairs is quite rare. You ready? I have no idea, man. Oh, Kangari. King <laughs> so the, the namesake of the Ks. Cool. Yep. <laughs> so that will probably be my pride and joy for the rest of my collection <laughs> eternity. Jeez. With, uh, with that one, I'm down to needing Rumorudi and Brakina as the last two wow. type falls, which I guess unless you, you know, if they go with uh, Lungana, you know, I don't think that one's, uh, I don't think I'll be finding that one either. So uh, potentially three more incredibly hard to find micros for, for prototypes. So no. if you have them, hook Mike up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I also, was that all of them, buddy? Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's what I got for today. Awesome. Thank you. I, I also saw a card from uh, Martin Goff on there. Uh, Martin has uh, joined the hunt for Winchcomb, I believe, as well. Um, we have Marissa. Are you ready? Yep, I am ready. So oh, yeah. I'm going to tell you, I've got quite a few ones to show you. I've got like five new ones. I've just oh. been flooded with meteorites here. So the uh, first one is Pungar. Yeah. Oh. That's the only H7 melt breccia in existence. Yeah, I was, uh, I reached out to Roberto to see if he had any that I could afford that was in my price range. And he pulled up this one and I'm very, very happy for it. And I think there's even a tiny little bit of uh, like two or three spots of fusion crust on the edge, which I'm not going to be able to show because it's just mm -hmm. too small. Yeah. But yeah, I just loved, I loved all the metal. metal and, yeah, I, I loved how much metal was in it and it looked so angular, like so similar to... Um, I'm trying to think of it. Um, the um, Portela's Valley? Yeah, that's yeah. it. Yes. Yeah. Every time I see a really high quality piece of Pungar, that's what I think of. And then the next one I have, I've been waiting for a long time to find a really good one. Oh, Norton oh, County. Norton County? No. Yeah, the, the, uh, the Albright Norton County. And I'm, I'm really forward with this one. I got a nice, a nice plane. Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> what did you just do? Wow. Oh my word. That's a melt, right? Yeah, that's, that's an entire that that's an, a melt vein, but it broke on the plane. So you've wow. got the whole thing. Awesome. Wow. That is super special. Um, because earlier in the show, Daniel Shake was talking about Albrights and the size of the crystals. So there you can actually see how large that crystal is. Um, and then as it was rotating, you see the size of the, of the crystals in the Albright. They're just massive um, mm. compared to those in the Instatite that he was showing us. Hmm. Yeah, hey, Marissa, have you checked it for uh, fluorescence yet? It's a good size well, piece. You might have some good fluorescence in there. I, I have checked, and hopefully this will show up. Let me turn out the light and see if this shows up. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Oh, nice. That's, that's cool. Congratulations. That is awesome. That is perfectly. Holy. Look at those specs there. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Yeah, I'm I'm just ecstatic with this one. 
two, two very desirable features on it, and it's 8.3 grams. Wow. Ooh. So yeah. I'm happy I waited so long to find a good one. Yeah, sure, we did find a good one. Yeah, that is amazing. Congrats. Yes, absolutely. And, uh, the last Look how beautiful, Look how beautiful the crystals are in that. Oh. I recognize that peel. <laughs> yep, yeah, we'll come out. Yep. Very beautiful double Camille. It is 78 grams. So, yeah, I was uh, nice. pretty happy about that. Yeah, that one just screams double Camille when you see it with all of the stippling on it. And we'll go ahead and give a shout out to... Aerolite meteorites. I think that's where they, they made that available to you. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. So uh, a bunch of people saw my uh, live broadcast from Aerolite in Tucson and connected with them to purchase meteorites. And uh, yep. we both appreciate that very much. Yeah. Yeah. I just couldn't say no mm -hmm. to. Oh. And then I've got this a Abba Penu. Oh. Yes. Nice. nice. Beautiful. Now, Abba Panu is a 3.6. Mike? Yeah. Isn't that what you were, was, or was your last one an LL 3.6? LL. Oh, thanks. Okay. Okay. I was going to say, because you don't have to spend that much money to get an LL 3.6. I got one for you. <laughs> <laughs> It's a, it's a 44 gram end cut, and I'm super happy with this. I got this from Mark Lyon. Ooh. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that, yeah. There's some beautiful chondrules on that one. It's wonderful. Can we and, see the back side of it? Can yeah. Let's, uh, the non crusty crust side. <laughs> and Abu is one of the ones I always was interested in because there's so much of it around and it's it's available, yeah, it, you know, and it only went estimated L3.6, not like they 100% L3.6. So yeah. I was always wondering about that. Why yeah, I never... The write-up um, write uh, in, in the, you know, buried in the text uh, describes, uh, suggests 3.6, yeah. And then the last one I've got to show is my newest power site. That's a, that's a beautiful end piece right there. Absolutely. Oh. Ooh. <laughs> dum, dum, dum. Good drooling on that one. That one is killer. And the etch on it is so pretty. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm, again, I'm, I'm, Extremely happy that I, I waited for, you know, choice specimens and, you know, my, <laughs> this was all my stimulus check. I got that <laughs> the wrong time, right before everybody did the live feeds at Tucson. And I'm like, oh God, I'm in trouble. Uh, <laughs> oh my gosh. Look at the olivine on the top. Like, I yep. hate to say that some broke off, but you got your money's worth because you got like a crap ton of olivine on that one. That is ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah, and the, the translucent seat might come up behind it. Oh, yeah. I mean, oh, that nice. is stunning. Oh. Absolutely. It's so gorgeous. And the range of colors, too, from the honey... Dark honey, brown through honey, through uh, lighter, and even into green. Yeah. Yeah, I I don't know why that one is. Well, I mean, obvi obviously olivine, but I was pretty surprised because you know I've seen so many MOX, but they're they're usually just that that orange and 
yellow. I, I don't too often. I've seen some green, but I'm I'm just very happy. I have a little bit of green in it. The what, beautiful. The green for us is that is it at one o'clock right there on on the edge? Yes. Yeah. If, if you see the the top olivine, it has like a greenish tint to it under the right lighting you can really see that one uh really come out green i saw i enjoyed this piece i i really really studied it on facebook and then i think over by about uh nine o'clock in that uh small um place there's another green uh like a what we call them is uh green apple or apple green mm -hmm. um yep. uh, and it's just gorgeous even right there, you can see the total translucency, the full crystal structure, and the metal etch. Oh, yeah. So I'm I'm very happy with this. Uh, it's 18 grams. Wow. Yeah, that's a nice size slice. Damn. I hope you have a nice container for it. <laughs> uh, oh, I, I do. Yeah, definitely. Man. That is gorgeous. Yeah, thanks. For, yeah. Did you have another piece or was that it? Nope, that's, that's that all of them. Thank you so much for sharing those with us. Those are like amazing pieces. The yeah. Abapanu end cut, and then you finish with the Imalac. It's like, are you crazy? <laughs> I thought you were going to stop at the Gevel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and um, I, I couldn't ship through all of those obviously myself so you know big shout out to my sister for switching through all of them and helping me show and tell thanks sis we appreciate it love you <laughs> yeah. thank uh, you so much marissa yeah you, you scored some solid pieces solid Let me, uh... yeah, thanks, guys hey cameron what do you got for us buddy i uh Long time viewers remember the meteorite crater, meteor crater sand, right? Mm -hmm. So we'd put a magnet to it and I found the little spheroids in there and I got to looking in my cabinets and discovered horror of horrors that those little spheroids in my sand were the only Canyon Diablo I had. Oh. Hoover went live from Aerolite. Mm -hmm. And I had him snag me this little 13.3 gram Canyon Diablo. Oy. I liked it. It had little points on there. But anyway. Um, and the only other thing I got was the OG Chelyabinsk. Mm -hmm. The uh, Kunishak. Yeah. Cool. Uh. I, I don't know why they didn't name that one Chelyu Binks, but I'm super glad they didn't. I like this uh, jellyfish looking spot in it. Yeah. That is great. But yeah. That's all I had. That one I, I had a hard time getting rid of, to be honest with you. <laughs> uh, it was my, my, only, uh, my only sample that I had, and, and I have to focus my collection a little bit, so I was like, ah. All right, he was interested. Uh, I'm like, uh, let me see. Oh, we got. I think Chris Monk is trying out his camera. Don't know if we're gonna go to him or not. Let me hit pause for one second. All right, so now we are going to stop for our update on um, Mars exploration, and we actually have some uh, interesting news about uh, successful flights. This is Ingenuity's third flight and i've edited it enough to hopefully make it not copyrighted <laughs> i always there you go sorry how level that flight is well. We see Z going to five meters, and then in the Y axis, which is relative to the starting position, we see the helicopter going out to 50 meters and coming back again. 
Look at that. Better than I fly my DJI drone. <laughs> that is amazing. So that was the third and longest flight of Ingenuity. That one, as we heard, was uh, 50 meters out and 50 meters back. So that's a total of 330-something feet or something, I guess. Yeah, 338 or thereabouts. Um, yes. So... We're, we're getting there. We're, you know, we went for the first flight was just lift off and then come back down. You know, the next one was lift up, gimbal a little bit, mess with the X and Y axis, and then put it back down. Now they're like, screw it, take it up, run it down there, bring it back, land it. And <laughs> so growing, but the confidence is growing by leaps and bounds, which is, which is good to see. Uh, there is one thing that we shouldn't be confident in, and that's eBay. Oh, <laughs> uh -oh. And, uh, uh -oh. the best to write two hundred and twelve. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 So, China. This is what we're dealing with now, guys. Some uh, some fake palisites, and uh, let me show you what uh, I actually have some here. Um, thanks to uh, Sheng. So hold on one second. So uh, we're very fortunate to have um, Dr. Yang, Sheng Yang, who is able to secure some of this fake meteorite. <coughs> and he sent me some pieces of it, and I can't zoom in. Beautiful. <laughs> so I have about I think eight slices of this fake meteor, this fake palisite, this man-made palisite. And I want to make them available to our knowledge bolide team crew members. Well, you so, know I will. Yeah, yeah, I would I would definitely like one as well. So oh, it'd make a great guitar pick. Yeah. This one right here is mine because it's translucent. Mm -hmm. And by the way, there is one stipulation to receiving one. You, you must do some polishing on it and put up a picture of it when it's done. Because this cutting that was done was minimal labor. Uh, it was really just cut to get it into pieces to get it into our hands. It's up to us now to make it look convincing. So. That is the only caveat to receiving a free piece is I only have a certain few. You have to be a crew member and you have to promise you're going to polish it up and, and display pictures of it and warn others. I'll run one and etch it. What's that? I said I'll run one and etch it because that's the etch is the thing they really can't fake. But I'd be interested to see what happens yep. uh, so, at a microscopic scale around uh, whatever they use for the olives. So I have a feeling I, if you etch it, it's going to dis disintegrate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> when, so this is what is super cool about um, my position here and being the conduit of information. Um, I get tapped on the shoulder to do the Winchcomb interview with the family. Um, I get tapped on the shoulder to help disseminate samples and information that collectors and dealers and enthusiasts like us need to have so we can actually show and teach other people. So I really want to show my appreciation to Shung, uh, Dr. Yang. Thank you very much. Um, there was also another one that was included. We have no idea what it is. Wow. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Um, Again, it's rough cut on this side, but if you look at this, like someone might be convinced that they're looking at a mesosiderite. But mesosiderites are 50% silica and 50% metal. So we should have extremely high magnetism, right? 
<laughs> but but there but there it is, is it, it is track. magnetic in places. Sorry, go ahead. There is some attraction though. Yeah, right there. There's a vein of something. Huh. So now, if does I take the magnet away? You'll see there is something there. Does the metal-looking stuff does it look like epoxy or? My camera is on. Well, Zoom is not allowing my camera to zoom in, which kind of blows because it's a. There you go. It's about the best of a shot as I can get. Huh. It's re and I only have one piece of this, so don't all ask for it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. The 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 other one would be fine for uh, for me to play with. Uh, and and that the the fake palisite looking one looked like it might the look like the part that's supposed to be metal was metal filings and epoxy. It is extremely magnetic. I mean, oh, it, it wow. is too magnetic. If you huh. ask me, it's too magnetic. Interesting. Palisites don't have that. Well, maybe I'm too scared to let my magnet snap. <laughs> but on a real palisite, but that, that seems to have a lot of draw. Um, Shane just uh, put something in the comments. Perhaps someone could read it out, please, if it makes sense he, to read it. He out. said he applied epoxy on the, the slice, but it looks metallic. Okay, yeah. Okay. Yeah. The, the other thing I'm interested in in the first fake palisite, um, and I mentioned this to him in a private message, was I'm interested to know if, uh, you know, Pat was saying shavings and... Um, epoxy but i'm interested to know if they just use pure shavings so it at least has the right nickel to iron concentration in it exactly so if you nickel tested that would it pop for nickel yeah and then really the only uh discerning factor would to tell it's 100 percent fake would be a fact that you wouldn't get wood's matte and steam pattern around it yeah yeah and the vidmastatin pattern or or uh uh armstrong uh pattern thompson structure yeah uh, thompson sorry thank mm -hmm. you um uh those are basically impossible to fake because the the, time, the cooling rate is not achievable in human life lifespans. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I uh, I did want to make one announcement. Uh, I made an announcement last week that all the shirts arrive for people. Um, so I want to make sure that you guys know I have your shirts and I will send them with your next order. Um, the shirts are going to be free of charge. I just ask that you throw a meteorite right in the bag with it. So, and those uh, of you who are on the list, I already have your, your shirt and you know who you are. So uh, the shirt is free. Just uh, get with me and, and get a meteorite right for your collection and I'll get it sent out to you. Thanks, Dover. That's really generous. Yeah, that's great. Thank you guys. Um, well, uh, it, it's a team effort. Um, putting the, putting this, I call it a TV show, putting a two hour TV show together every week is, is no simple task and there's no way in the world I could do it by myself. So I rely on the crew and I'm just a member of the crew. So I appreciate um, all your guys' um, uh, cooperation and assistance and, and, and just being here each and every week, you know, 49, 50 weeks in a row, we haven't missed one yet. So gotta, gotta pay it back to my folks. Uh, does anyone else have something they'd like to show off? I just had a real quick comment, uh, Topher. The uh, I, I I put the link on uh, uh, in the chat of that flashlight. There's one called a Lone Fire, and there's a 10 watt model that uh, really works amazingly well, and it's very reasonably priced. Awesome. Uh, I am buying that with the sole purpose of illuminating the piece of Norton County that I showed last week, um, because as soon as I show it, it will be sold. Guaranteed. <laughs> Guaranteed. <laughs> so, and it's not like this is about sales, but it's just that I bought it to resell, and I want to be able to show you guys the fluorescence of it. You did um, buy it to resell. How many grams was that one? Um. I honestly forget. It was it was a four grams roughly, something like that. Uh, if you'll put and my name on that, please. It is just a hundred. I mean, sixty percent of it's going to iridesce. Yeah, uh, yeah. If you put my name on that, please. 
In fact, I could throw it in a bag with your shirt and send it to you, and you could show it to us next week. That way, I don't have to buy a black light. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be fine. <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> well, I do have a a really bad taste in my mouth after seeing all that just nasty fake stuff. So let's go to uh, remote reporter Chris Monk and see what he has for us today. Howdy, it, Chris. It's a Borg. Unmute. Oh, there I am. There we Are go. You there? Yes. Sorry, I couldn't unmute. So last week I was showing off a stone that I said this week I would display after I cut it. So this was that stone and it has a little bit of metal in it. Mm. This is the one that had the, all the crust on it. Mm. Yeah. So this is the end cut. It does have some nice chondrules in there, mm -hmm. but when I was cutting it, it was very crumbly. Yeah. So I started super thin mm -hmm. and it was just disintegrating um, mm -hmm. as I was cutting it. And so these couple of slices, I decided to um, coat and not polish because it's so thin and crumbly. Mm -hmm. um, and here's, really, I, I lost like a third of the stone oh, no. when I was, because I cut it so thin mm -hmm. um, of this slice, not stone. Oh. Um, so anyway, I mean, I think that the bigger pieces, so I started cutting it about twice that thick. And I, those pieces I'm going to polish. These are these ones I'm just going to coat. Mm -hmm. um, but then after that, I was like, you know, just didn't do it for me. So I grabbed another one. And I showed Topher a couple of pictures of this. But the cool part mm -hmm. about this is about every other slice um, has a bunch of armored chondrules. Nice. Cool. So, like you can see, this one it has some pretty good size chondrules in it, and these haven't been polished yet, so they're a l not as shiny as they will be. Ooh, look at but, that big chondrule on there! Yeah, yeah. some big right. ones, and if you look right there, you can kind of see the armored piece. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's a couple of half armored ones. Yeah. Uh, wonder, this one has an what causes the the predominance in some meteorites like Abba Panu and this one. Look at that one. Jeez. Yeah. Yeah. So I actually got quite a few. I got maybe about 20 slices out of this one. Nice. Wow. With some big class, big chondrules. A lot of armored chondrules. Um, yeah, this one, once I polish this up, I think this one will display really well. That's great. I got, here's a couple more. Are you making Big them clips. available? Um, I, I will make them available. Okay. Look at the top of that. That That's the best slice so far. Look at that metal bleb, and then you have like five huge chondrules on it. Yeah. Yep. And there's one armored chondro right there in the middle and another kind of oblong armored mm -hmm. piece right there. I don't know if that's a chondro, but. Yep. Cool. Sweet. So anyway, I just, some of those um, turned out really great, but even the ones that aren't super great are still great. And um, yeah. I'm super excited to get them polished once I'm not working 72 hours a week. <laughs> and so, Chris, was that an MWA number? No, this is this no. is a unclassified. Unclassified, okay. But it's got enough metal in it. I would say that it's probably an H. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And maybe in the five-ish to six. Yeah. Yep. But just 
Wow. When I when I this is this is one of the first pieces after the end piece. Mm -hmm. And I just and that right there, that armored chondral just stuck out to me and I was like, yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it, man. That was that was just you know one of the the first things I noticed, and I was just ecstatic. I was super excited, and I was like standing out in my driveway, just. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> <That's great. awesome. laughs> as as you're going through cutting, if you run into issues or questions, I'm going to volunteer him for you, even without his permission. Stephen Amara is the master cutter. So, um, of Condrace. So, um, I would talk to him. Um, I, you did a better job than I would do, but let me give you a tiny, tiny little bit of critique at the very end of your cut, slow down the tiniest little bit. Um, they seem to have little flares, little legs on them. And that's mm -hmm. by, by forcing it at the last second and the rock breaks before the saw goes through. So at the very, very end, slow down to like, Four percent and just go super slow let the blade scare you when it pops out yeah i i actually so the way my saw is so i've seen on steve's videos on when he was cutting and he has a horizontal blade and he's cutting and he kind of holds his hand underneath it mine's a vertical blade and the um the clamp slides on a rail and it suspends the stone about a quarter inch off so I try to hold it and I do slow down the blade. But as I'm coming to the end, I will like put my hand up against the stone. So when it drops, I can kind of catch it and, and slow it way down. But for whatever reason, and maybe just because my saw is a 10 inch and not a um, six inch. Mm. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm working on that. I will definitely get better. And I appreciate the, the hey, knowledge. Chris, Chris yeah. one other thing you can look at doing is is backing it so if you have a backer just like when you're cutting mm -hmm. like wood if you have a, a yeah. sacrificial backer board on there right the saw the blade doesn't blow out because you have something that the meteorite is pushing against at the very end of the cut so you don't get sure. blow out see and i even thought um i'm a little bit afraid on some of the stones especially the ones that are round and really hard to clamp i thought well what if i took some like mortar and like encased it and then just cut through that way it would cut through the stone clean i could break off but then you have the lie and the cement and, and that you kind know, of stuff when you look at people doing like the wire saws and some of the bigger things uh they'll just use hot glue to get them mounted on a board yeah so i mean glue. even that gives you the backer you need so that first stone that i cut the one with all the crust on it i did that what i did was i took a piece of um travertine and i hot glued the stone to it and then built the sides up with the glue mm -hmm. and I tried to it worked really good for the first couple of cuts but maybe I just didn't use enough hot glue um, it started to break free and so the last couple of cuts I really had to hold on to the stone and so when I cut the second one it was easier to clamp so I just free cut it yeah I'm, I'm not a I'm not a cutter myself but I'm surprised when I see that people who know what they're doing, <laughs> um, I'm surprised at how much hot glue they use. I mean, it yeah. is just coated and caked. Um, in fact, when I'm done, um, I'll send you a picture uh, that um, Stephen Amara sent me, Space Matter uh, sent me of my Irichidia stone that he was cutting. And you can see how much, it's a 60 gram stone and you'll see how much he used on that one alone. So, um, yeah, but I, I don't mean to give you a hard time whatsoever because those are beautiful slices. They're straighter than anything I'm cutting now and you've only been cutting for like four or five weeks. So you're doing fantastic, man. Well, I appreciate that. So just, uh, I have cut quite a few terrestrial stones um, and I laid tile for a long time. So <laughs> I've, I've cut a lot of top. <laughs> so I have a, I do have a little experience with the saw, but this new saw I have is is an actual lapidary saw. It's not a tile mm -hmm. saw, and so it makes all the difference in the world being able to clamp it and slide it on a rail and control it with the amount of weight I put on the draw. And so yeah, it makes it makes a ton of difference. Uh, one of these days, uh, I'm going to get out to see you, 
rather than you coming always to see me, I'll, I'll come out to, I'll come out to, to the nuclear way. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Yeah. Appreciate you joining us, man. And great, no great job on the cutting, sharing that stuff with us. And um, like you said, it's available. So uh, if you, if you want a slice, hit Chris Monk up and uh, he'll get you that. Um, Ron Metchis, he's, yeah. he's cleaning up the batting order today. What okay, you I just have a buddy? cookie. Um, so when I'm, I have a 705 gram piece of Odessa, it's hand cut, right? If you notice, you can't see much of the Whitman Stoughton or whatever you want to call lines, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Thomas lines. So I'm, I'm going to be etching this, I think, in the next week or two. And hopefully I get some decent results out. I would really like this rock. I've had it for a number of years. So uh, not going to cut it. I don't cut anything. But uh, just a heads up, I'll be putting another video of this out sooner or later. And um, with that, I'm going to also add to your announcement because um, I have, I've already talked to you about it. So um, I got your approval now that you're uh, all recovered and feeling well. Yep. Uh, I have about five slices of uh, my new classified um, NWA iron that are in very poor shape. They need to be stabilized. They need to be uh, refinished and made to pop. Okay. So you're happy, with, uh, you're happy with the way I, that I, I was doing it? Ron, I, I've enjoyed watching all of your procedures, your experiments, your learning curve. Um, I, I trust you with these. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I have no, I have no problem with that. They're very important iron, so don't screw them up. <laughs> no, I, yes, I, sir. I, yes, sir. I have confidence. It puts away there. If you don't step in, if someone doesn't step in, they're going to be ruined. So okay. something is better than nothing at this point. And I have this entire box going to Craig, as I said earlier, I want these done first. So I'm sending them to you and, uh, Hopefully that will make a, a good project for you. Don't let Emily oh, yeah. anywhere, anywhere near him. No, no, no. I don't want to touch these. She, she, she's, it's a cutter. She's yeah. And, and, and um, yeah, it would be, it'd be cool to, to see the before and after pictures because they're okay. in hideous, hideous shape right now. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll do my usual video thing. I'll, I'll, I'll start with one. and uh, I think I can do multiple rocks at the same time because if, if they're relatively small, my tank is, I don't know, about a foot 14 inches long or something like yeah. that. Small they're, uh, they're like 25 gram slices. They're really oh, small. It's nothing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And they have they have like visible rust coming out in between the crystals. So yeah, they, they need some work. Okay. Um, think, okay. Okay. Yeah. So I'll I'll send them to you and yeah, it'll be a cool project for everyone to, to keep in the loop. You, you said you had a larger piece also, uh half kilogram oh, yeah. something or other. Yeah I have a, a kilo of um Gibeon, I'm going to send okay. you as well, because okay. it, it doesn't need to be stabilized. This just needs to be re-etched. Yeah, what I'll do, I'll start with my little Odessa here. Mm -hmm. And I'll uh, you know, kind of make sure things are working okay. Then I'll the, the, the reason I'm sending that, if, you, if, uh, if those weekly viewers will remember, uh, I uh, tried to acid etch my own um, Gibeon about a month and a half to two months ago and just mucked it up completely with old uh, acing, uh, etching acid and just ruined the piece. So it needs a professional to, to give it a nice shine and give it a nice etch with fresh materials and, and make the make the, the pattern uh, jump out. There. Well, we have come to the time of the show once again where the show is over and it's time to hit the like and subscribe button. Goodbye, everyone. Thanks, everyone. I had a great fun week with you. Okay. Take care. Thank you, Tober. Hi, guys. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thanks, Tober. Have a good week, everybody. Bye. Good to see you, everybody. See you Take next care. week. Adios. Yep. Bye, guys.